Hello there, generals. So, I spoke about a particular the third position, right? And uh, and I said, you know what, there's this, um, there's this tendency that has arisen in the right wing recently, which is, of course, the socialistic tendency to decide to pick the weapons used against, uh, let's say, the left, against to the right, against the right, uh, pick the weapon, which is particularly the state, and to use it against everyone else, in the hopes that by getting control of the weapon, it cannot be used against, uh, it can be used against us, and of course, if someone it does craft a similar weapon in another state, we have this weapon to fight that weapon. So, you know, it's a matter of the nukes, right? Should we should we get rid of the nukes or should we just keep the nukes and use it as a deterrent? And hopefully nobody, you know, steals the nukes from us. So the third position, generals, is very simply this. And uh, you know, uh, the thing though is that they don't want the third position is to feel that obviously the Marxist uh, sort of the Marxist uh you know conception of the world Still wrong, right? A lot of things wrong with it, but there's some useful thing with it. And the right wing, you know, they don't really like freedom or capitalism that much because they feel that it makes you know us vulnerable and weak to uh, you could say subversion or take over. But anyway, this video that Kate Keith Woods um, you know put out, and let's hear it, shall we? Let's hear it. Hmm. So. What is third position? Third position is a political philosophy, so called because it is an alternative to the two dominant political positions of modernity, liberal capitalism and Marxian communism. There are many branches of third positionism, such as fascism, Spanish phalangism, Catholic integralism, and Peronism. What yeah, so eventually what you end up with is sort of not uh, you could call it quasi authoritarian regimes, so the quasi so you see the the uh, combination. Uh, effectively, you don't you still have private means of production, but it's under control of the state, and that's a combination that they see the third position seeks really. They want to combine the w the good aspects of what they view as the good aspects of all these systems, combine them together. Um, they don't really, so they don't necessarily look the uh, the disturbance uh, interference of the state made during the economy is a good thing and or necessary. Certainly useful to use to prevent um, let's say subversion or takeover from outside. Certainly, so there's that. Now, unfortunately, the funny part is that every single one of these regimes has collapsed. Every one of them has just fallen. Um, whether it be glows, whether it be glows, instigating stuff, or simply the people they don't want to go and do it anymore, they lo lost a war. Or they simply gave up for for some bizarre reason that they decided, well, we're just gonna give up the um give up the government. That just give up. And, you know become democracy or whatever. You know, but every single one of these regimes has just you know fallen apart. So that's a problem that the third position is gonna have to deal with. Uh, how do you not fall apart this time? What unites all of these philosophies? By the way, it wasn't. I mean, for example, the United States Republic has lasted over two hundred years. These regimes lasted at most a few decades, maybe one or two, three decades, and then boop, gone. So yeah, longevity is this mixed t system thing. Uh, it looks like um, it's not very stable. It's not very. It, like, it's supposed to be this harmonious, stable system, but they just un they unravel from within. By the way. In, in a way, in a way, they seem to be pretty good at resisting outward pressure. I mean, you need you literally need to get a, a gigantic army to like b hammer them to bring them down. Effectively, from the outside, you just, you can't so easily just come in and just like seep in. However, if it's not the massive armies that will stamp them, like you know Italy, they just they end up unraveling from within. I don't know the leadership just abandons the whole thing, or the people just decide to go crazy and you know. Break it up, yeah. ...is staunch opposition to individualism and the materialism of both capitalism and communism. And the desire... Yeah, so, this, so they try to subject the, the entire population to this collectivist, regi regimentalized thing, which, for some reason, unraveled. It just it unraveled. 
because it seemed in their attempt, in their constant attempt to try to uh, subsume the individual in this collective, there's just too many individuals who are just resisting this, and eventually just it just just can't do it anymore. Just boom, breaks apart. They're either forced to scale back. That's what happened. They're they're, they're supposed they're gonna they start scaling back on these things because it becomes just untenable, and then they collapse into democracy. So, yeah, and uh, that's the thing, right? I mean, you end up with all these countries, you end up with something worse, really. I mean, <laughs> democracy, yeah. You end up with probably one of the worst things, democracy. I, I, I think that every single country that they cite, like Argentina, Peron, they had, you know, you had the uh, Phalanges, Spain, Italy, and whatever. All of them are democracies now. And all of them are suffering from, you know, this, um, this, uh, sort of, you know, the liberalism that they often whine about. Well, yeah, they're suffering on the radar, right? They're suffering under the worst kind of it. This sort of egalitarian weird thing, yeah. That's what they're suffering under. So, it, in the end, it doesn't seem to work so well. Trying to subsume an individual within the collective doesn't seem to work so well. If in, in a way, you end up with this weird pendulum swing, actually, where people, you know, because they're constantly trying to be to being compressed into being pressed into these these molds, they just swing that away, boom, and then you end up with that away, which is even worse, <laughs> like way worse. Instead of a balance, instead of the balance, which is what they want, they just end up with super individual individualism, which melts into democracy and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, again, or to unite people around a higher ideal. Do you find yeah, but it it, it it falls. That's a problem. It inevitably just falls. It just there's a higher ideal. Maybe the problem here's the thing. Uh, what happens is that when they're promised people, that people are promised this higher ideal and all this stuff, but eventually it loses its luster. Eventually it loses its shine. And once that happens, it's over. In principle, may differ, be it race, cultural nationalism or religion, but the ideal is the same, an organic state, all parts of society working in harmony for the benefit of society. Just This is a theoretical model, but it doesn't work. Always there's going to be some big conflict somewhere here and there. It's, it's trying to like fit everyone, everything together. And t- Here's the thing, because it's not like they're trying to let the, the, just let the things arrange themselves into a sort of harmonious balance. They're trying to force it to, to work in that boy's balance. Like they're trying to force that harmony in. And that's when they, things go wrong. They don't know. The thing with these central planner types, they don't know what the hell they're doing. They don't know. They don't know how to actually do that. Right? So they end up messing it up and making things, again, worse. This is all parts of a body work together in harmony for the benefit of the body. In this sense, third position sees materialism, the lack of a unifying ideal, and individualism the lack of a sense of social duty as symptoms of decay and degeneration. A healthy bo- Yes, this is a third positionist view of effectively what I would call decline, decadence. You know, they see that, sort of in, the, they see that people are not uh, being altruistic enough. That's really what, what we could say in, uh, in more objectivist terms. People are not being altruistic enough. They're being too selfish. And this is what's causing the, the, the decline of society and the, the collapse. Well, more, let's say, Hoppy, for example, would actually say, actually, no, it's actually the state which enables this kind of decadent behavior, this kind of irresponsible decadent behavior, and which eventually leads to un- the un- unraveling of society. Because, for example, one way one way it can be done is, let's say that you have a society, and the state has, in, in a way, taken over the social functions. What happens is that a social function within the, in the people itself again, is an atrophy. And now, because and the state is taking over, so now the people are going to atrophy. For example, a, a showing of this is actually, uh, if you look at places where there's more welfare, there's less charity, there's less private charity, which is obvious, right? Obviously, but that shows you that as more of the social functions are taken over by the state, the individuals will start atrophying. That ability in the individuals will start atrophying more and more and more, so they'll become more and more dependent on the state to do these functions, which in the end becomes untenable because the state is always made of individuals, right? So you just end up with uh, no you just end up with a bunch of individuals who um, which are trusting the government, which oh yeah, let me get the government to do it. And boop, that's over. 
and then you know it goes to it goes really bad well if people are if people are made aware that hey actually no the social function lies with you and you alone not this this monopolistic entity is trying to monopolize the social functions but it lies with you people with your people then maybe you could get you know what you want and also of course the harmony the concept and not forcing everyone to try to work together like you did you have to force everyone to work together just please body cannot have its parts pursuing individual interests at the expense of everyone else, or this will ultimately lead to the death of the body. Well, here's the thing with the body. First of all, there's cells that, that commit, you know, that blow themselves up all the time. So, the thing with the cells is this, uh, compared with the, yeah, I get it, compared with the body, but the thing with the body, however, is that uh, the body is perhaps... I don't say the body is a true, a truly centrally controlled entity, to a certain degree. In the sense of the DNA in the body is like the central control mechanism, really. That, that's, that's really the central control mechanism, the DNA. So, for the body, so what it shows is that for the body, central planning seems to work to a certain degree. Because the DNA, you know, the DNA which encodes it all, uh... Sometimes it fails, sometimes, you know, it ends up, like, say, having, you know, cancer appear. But in general, it seems to work. It seems to, you know, it, it, it wipes out cells that, you know, are pro- it needs to wipe out. But the way that happens, right? It sacrifices the cells all the time. It rearranges stuff. Make sure that things don't grow too much here or there. So, yeah, it works for the body, I guess. But the question is, um, for the human polities, you don't. You have this sort of. You have you know the ideas of um, consciousness. You have. You know the the funny they, they try to use they try to say well the uh, capitalism in this is just materialistic. Well in a way the body is, hundred percent materialistic in the way it functions really, so you know, in a way it, the irony would be that, in try to say well the body is how this how the body works together and all this so uh, maybe in a tr- in full materialism. That is the case. But in humans who are not only thinking materialistic terms, this may not work. This it, it may truly not work for um, humans. Right? But yeah, it's weird because the idea, the trend to do is the third possession is supposed to be this sort of more metaphysical, like transcend the material. But you know, they're trying to compare their for their set well, the central planning works with the body, which is hundred percent materialistic thing, so it'll work with our central planning. I suppose the element is that we're gonna have to, the, we're gonna have we're gonna add this metaphysical, spiritual, idealistic aspect to our central planning, which is going to, in a way, appease or assuage the, or, you know, kind of fits with the metaphysical, more metaphysical, abstract thinking that humans have, and that way you make the central planning that works for the human body work for humans. Neither can people selfishly pursue their individual or class interests at the expense of the social body. Therefore, third positionists are equally opposed to the parasitism of welfare given without a corresponding sense of duty to society. Yeah, so a lot of third positions, by the way, will, don't, may not have necessarily a problem with welfare, but it would put some very strict stipulations on them. So, you know... Um, they're not necessarily against, they're not necessarily against welfare, but, you know, there's specific, uh, like, they will say, well, maybe you have to sterilize yourself, whatever, or you will have to get sterilized if you want welfare. This is, uh, this is one of the uh, stipulations that can be set, um, by third position is when they're doing welfare or whatever. So, uh, yeah, and it's a very interesting thing, right? They're, they're trying to, like, they're trying to... I suppose that the sort of pragmatic, uh, you don't hear the pragmatic, you know. Well, we're just trying to pick what everything that works and put it together. They don't really care about principles, but just, you know, they're just trying to pick up fragments of what they see, th- they think works or what suits them and, you know, put this system up. And the parasitism of a capitalist class that lives in luxury. Ah, yes, here comes the, the parasitism of capitalist class. Luxury through exploitation of the rest of society. And this is where you end up with this sort of... This is the Marxist component that they pick. Right? They pick the, the sort of Marxian analysis. The positions like to pick Marxian analysis and um, where they feel like it's, 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 it's proper and light. 
So here, while the capitalist class is exploiting the rest of society and living wealthily, right? Um, well, that's a very ambiguous thing, of course, right? Is that well, exploit? What do you mean exploiting exactly? Is it is it that they're wealthy? Is it that how they get their wealth? And then the question is, how do they get their wealth? Now, in a libertarian term, in libertarian or capitalistic terms, um, you know, leeching wealth to the state because through monopolies or through contract, government contracts, well, all these things. So libertarian, this is, you know, bad and a problem. And so it, I guess it depends on how the, it depends on how the um, wealth is acquired by this class. In the theoretical sense, the capitalist class would simply be owning things, would simply be the, simply the ones who, through whether it be genius or luck, but you know, luck is not that big, not the biggest factor. It's really, you know, whether it be through force of will or whatever the hell it was, or charisma, but they um, were able to, you know, amass and manage increasing amounts of capital until you know they became wealthy. Um, before they are quite wealthy that way, and in a way, by properly managing these these this this capital, this mass of capital, this mass of capital actually became uh, you can say valuable in the first place. Really, you know, all this capital has to be managed properly. Like mismanaged capital is, in the long term, worthless. If you mismanage capital, it's gonna go to it's gonna it's gonna go bad, really bad, actually. Um, you know, mismanage a company, you know, it can be wealthy and all that, but it can go bankrupt and just collapse and be worth pennies afterwards. So, yeah, management is very important, and that's the thing that they seem to uh, completely, the Marxists seem to also very well not pay attention towards, that, you know, ma management does add, in a way, does add value to the capital and labor and all this stuff, you know. And they would have to recognize, actually, that if they're to a position that they're trying to, they're trying to balance everything out, they should recognize that in reality, it's it's these things should work. These things work together, right? And if you just let them be, these three things will be labor and management and capital, whatever the hell you know. These things will work together in, in balance. Oh, the the problem is that some things in balance. I guess it's a problem. It, it should be working in balance, but something's in balance in the system. Something's imbalancing it. Um, because what you see is while the capitals are becoming too wealthy for our taste. Something, for some reason, they're getting more wealthier, wealthier and the lesser labor is getting less, less wealthy than it should be in, in, in balance, if you had balance. And therefore, we have to like interfere with that to try to impose balance. While, yeah, so that, that's the thing. Is it that you have to impose balance, or is it that something is disturbing the balance? And if you just get rid of that, you end up with balance. So this is the balance between, let's say, the Hoppians and the third sort of position, more socialistic types. You know, is it that the balance is being disturbed, or is it that the balance needs to be imposed? If the the problem is that if indeed it is the case that and balance is let's say the natural order, we will expect that long term things being left to their own devices. They will go to the balance because that's just the natural. That's just the baseline. So just leave. If you just uh, leave it be, it's going to naturally go. You know, naturally nev um go to the you know natural order and balance itself out. But if you have to force it, if you have to force it, quote unquote balance, is it really part of the natural order? Is the question. Is it really the natural order if you have to impose it? You have to put it down. So that is one of the very important questions. It's balance. So all there is, and that's what the third position is really seeks balance. They want to balance things out. That's why they're picking from what is the deem as kind of opposite sides to a certain degree. They're trying to pick those things up and try to balance it, balance the weight. Get a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and try to uh, make sure that it doesn't go too much, too much uh, one direction or another. In place of the class warfare of Marxism and the rampant individualism of capitalism, third position. The thing with capitalism is that it doesn't necessarily... Uh, the thing with capitalism is there's nothing to really prevent. In Marxism, you have to join a collective, otherwise you have to get, you know, get wiped out or whatever. Uh, for capitalism or, you know, freedom or liberty or whatever, you can join whatever collective you want. You can decide to join together whatever you seek. 
Now, there might be a certain trend towards individualism. There's always going to be presence of individualism. Because individuals exist. And in the end, every single polity and group and community is going to be based around... It's going to be built from the individual. It's from That is a building block of every community. So, you're going to end up with things collapsing to always to the world's individual. So you, when you build these communities, you have to, these groups, you have to have some sort of structure to keep it, you know, intact. Because it always it's going to collapse towards the individuals. Now, if you have these individuals uh, properly working in harmony with the other individuals around them, and, you know, they can voluntarily go join certain groups and work in harmony with them, you know, they can just do that. There's nothing again, in capitalism that necessarily uh, prevents this. And nothing that necessarily even uh, disincentivizes this. Because, you know, working, uh, being part of particular groupings, being part of particular communities, being part of whatever, has its benefits, as, you know, we know. That's why that's why right wingers, you know, push for this in the first place. So, there's going to be natural incentives if you just give people, you know, the liberty to do so, to join these communities and liberties, and not necessarily just spiral out of this optimistic individualism, right? So this thing about, well, it's just a natural result of capitalism that you end up in, optimist, in this optimistic individualism. Guess what I really talk about? It's not just, it's not really individualism itself what they talk about. It's um, what you would call atomism, which is that now, because atoms are like just really, I don't like the cores of atoms are really, really tiny, and you have this massive space between the cores of atoms. So, in you know, if you look at the atomic scale, the distance between atoms is huge. Now, the average distance between atoms is enormous in that scale. So, you know, the, the mean the atoms are you know the distance, the social distance between individuals becomes massive. You know, in this day, oh, it's capitalism, it's freedom. People naturally navigate towards being like this and stuff more and more and more and more and more. And so, boom, right? But if again, if we're social creatures, then doesn't really make sense because why would we naturally, if we just give him liberty, naturally navigate towards being far and far away from our humans? Doesn't really make sense, yeah. By the way, we go on. Position ideology desires class cooperation. If an organic society can be achieved, individuals and classes will work together in harmony. They'll be forced to be to work together as the central planners see fit. That's the key point. That kind of let it let it like under the rug. Workers will get a fair wage and benefits for their labor. And this is the five again with the central planners. What the hell is a fair wage? We got no idea. How how, how do you calculate a fair wage? How do, what is the methodology by which you get a fair wage? All these things. In the end, without like proper price mechanisms in place, there's no way of really knowing. No central planners really figured out how to properly calculate. Okay, what what is what should be the wage of resource set? No, that's not really. They haven't figured that out yet. Maybe. Maybe they can trust some sort of technocratic system where the computer, ton of AI and computers try to figure out maybe have, but for human minds, this is out of reach. Labor, while entrepreneurs will be rewarded for their innovation so long as they uphold their duty to respect their workers and social obligations. This Which is against the but central planners. Understand, this is not set, these, these obligate, whatever, all these things are not set by the people anymore. You so the people surrender this power to the central planners, the third position is central planners, and they're gonna decide what the social obligations are and what 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 me, treating workers fairly, quote unquote, means, and all these things will be defined by them. So you are surrendering all this power to them. Right now, a particular other nefarious group has a lot of this power, but now you're gonna be transferred over to oh, okay, these people, and hopefully, hopefully they're better than the people we have right now, the 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 people then you know, the the people we have right now are doing all the things. Hopefully. But I will not trust them. I just won't. <laughs> and even knowing what the hell they're doing in the first place, by the way. The state should serve as an intermediary to ensure class cooperation for the benefit of everybody. To ensure, I hate to compel everyone to work together according to how the central planners of the state sees fit. Buddy. In the words of third positionist. In the end, it'll be for the benefit of the state, really. Which, in the end, this is what they want, right? They want it to be the benefit of the state. It's not going to be real, but they see because in, you know, in Adolfian terms, the state is the vessel of the people. So I think that two positions probably see it the same way. If it benefits the, the, the state, it'll probably benefit the people. Juan Perón. Once capitalist parasitism disappeared. Capitalist parasitism, yes. Uh, no, capitalism is not parasit... Par uh, pa capitalism is not parasitic by nature. <laughs> That's not how it works. Oh, um, capitalism naturally discourages parasitism by the simple fact that people don't want to be uh, people don't want to get parasitized on so they're going to do everything in their power to 
you know, make sure it doesn't happen. And, you know, there's every single, the, the people who a lot of parasites who have grown them are going to just get uncompeted and wither away, effectively, over time. I, I guess they have some sort of natural eugenic effect because, again, the parasite, the, yeah, again, the people who are vulnerable to parasites will slowly get withered away because there's, no, there's not going to be nothing to sustain them. And in the end, it's only if people who are really, really resistant to the say, parasites they are going to remain and flourish. And the parasites, once they can't really find anyone, you know, that can, they can easily, like, leech off, the puppy are also going to leave and go away. Takes time, but, you know, over time, uh, liberty capitalism will get will deal with the parasites. Ipso facto, classes will be eliminated. No more bourgeois or proletarian, but functionally and hierarchically organized producers in their companies. This economic... Yeah, so they're gonna impose this sort of weird um, artificial structure that hopefully works. That's what we pretty much here. And uh, yeah, parasitism. The state is is by nature parasitic. So I, I, this is something that you know let's talk about again. It's not the problem. It's not parasitism. It's who does the parasitizing. Because the state is parasitic in nature. It just um, they see the capitalist as parasitic. It's funny. It's like oh, well, parasitism is a problem. So that's. And we see capitalists as parasites, so let me establish a um, inherently parasitic um, an entity to take over everything and be as parasitic as it you know can, without being opposed. By the way, you know the parasitism of the state is probably the most difficult thing to oppose. And on top of that, it also allows parasites, really big parasites, to take over. I mean, look at today. Today, what happens? Parasites have taken over the state, then, or you know, use the state to you know, leech up everyone else. And cause all the problems. So, yeah. I'm still not sure. Uh, the thing is, I'm not still not sure how third position is deal with the subversion problem per se. Uh, how do you necessarily even get, make sure that, you know, they don't take over. That the parasites don't take over. That this system is not corrupted. By simply people take over. It's so, it's so easy to corrupt any of these systems. All you have to do is people sneak in, the parasites sneak in, the ruthless parasites sneak in, and they go in, and then they take over, and now they, they have, they can do whatever they want, because they have some damn power. Right? It's so easy to take over in such systems. What well, one day? Economic philosophy, called corporatism, was inspired by syndicalism of the early 20th century, a radical anarchist philosophy that wished to organize society around the mutual cooperation of workers' syndicates. And by royalists and traditionalists, who wished to correct the excesses of individualism brought about in the Enlightenment and create an organic, harmonious society in modernity. It also took... Yeah, so effectively what you end up with is a whole bunch of groups. Okay, here's another one. ...took inspiration from Catholic social thought. Distributism, outlined in encyclicals like Rerum Novarum, in which it is written, each needs the other. Okay, so what you end up with is these sort of... You have the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment wins, takes over, and pretty much conquers Europe. And uh, you have these forces which say, I don't, and then they see some things happening, and then you have these forces which say, I don't like the Enlightenment. I think the Enlightenment has some, has some problems, there's some problems going on with the Enlightenment. So you, they have examples, they have these, these um, syndicalist types of, in Russia. I, I suppose you can call it, this is what you, this is what you call the um, sort of like revolutionary force, which wants to see the, the Enlightenment and says, I think I can do better than the Enlightenment. You know, I think I can do better alignment. Um, uh, in a sense of, you know, we can evolve to the next stage with my system. Then the other two, which is the monarchists and traditionalists, are just reactionaries who see the alignment and say, uh, well, the alignment has toppled all our monarchies, and we think this is a problem. Uh, not in, in According to Hop, in Hop, for example, monarchies are banned in democracies. But anyways, um, monarchies see that the you know, the alignment has, according to them, the alignment has knocked out all the monarchies and that's causing a lot of trouble. And then the, the, the distributors, which are the Catholic thought, the, uh, what happens is the rationalism and the sort of, you know, the, you know, the rational empiricism of the alignment has severely weakened the power of the church, especially the Catholic church, you know, and less and less people believe in, you know, church doctrine. So, you know, the priests and the, you know, the Catholics got to figure out a way to, you know, stand their back. So, you know, all these, these things are reacting towards the element. And, yeah, now, 
all these systems haven't really... They haven't really been able to beat the Enlightenment back. <laughs> despite all their attempts. Now, the third position is the, the, another challenge to the Enlightenment. And they're probably not going to work. Again, I mean, the 20th century is full of... Uh, they showed quite a few um, third position tier type systems. And they all collapsed. They all fell under the onslaught of the Enlightenment. Eventually, even if the Enlightenment itself is being corrupted, because in a way the Enlightenment itself is being corrupted by, you know, the new, the, the, you know, the postmodern type of weirdness. But despite this corruption of the Enlightenment, the light is, you know, becoming a bit hazy now. Still, all these regimes fell to its onslaught. Which is very, uh, very interesting. Capital cannot do without labor, nor labor without capital. Correct. Labor and capital need each other. For now, anyway, until we get robots and machines, whatever. But yeah, for now, that's the case. Labor and so the labor and capital need each other. So what you end up is you're gonna end up with a natural, like mutual um, arrangement appearing because they need each other. So you're gonna see if you just let it be, it's not naturally form. Just because they need each other, the just fact that they need each other is gonna make them naturally form a sort of uh, mutualistic bond. Mutual agreement results in the beauty of good order while perpetual conflict necessarily produces confusion and savage barbarity. And capitalism does not necessarily disturb this balance. Well, statism very well does. What united all these seemingly disparate groups was the desire to transcend capitalism rather than appropriate it, as the Marxists had intended. That desire... Eh, yeah, react, improve, uh, you know... um, change it completely because you're going to do better than capitalism or simply get rid of it because it's a serious comp- a competitor to our systems. Whether it be monarchy, whether it be the rule of the church, you know, capitalism is a, a opponent to these things. So, you know, that's the thing. For the economy and society to be run on the basis of transcending individualism and economic reductionism is still what unites third positionists of every stripe. Yes, yeah, so you end up with this sort of metaphysical, weird metaphysical uh, underpinning. Well, we're going to transcend capitalism and materialism. Right? What the hell does this even mean? <laughs> what does this even mean, General? Well, what it means is very simple. We're going to rise from the mere materialistic aspects of the reality to the more metaphysical, more idealistic, more abstract, more plat- platonic, really, um, you know, ideals, the abstract. We're going to rise to that. And when we set the ideals up there, we're going to strive towards those ideals. The problem is that the ones who set those ideals are not the people, again, but they are the central planners. It's a, a central, the ideals is the vision for the central planners, who hopefully know what the hell they're doing, by the way, it's in the ideals. And then they're going to try to execute the plan to get to the ideal, which they see as good or great or whatever. But again, the problem is that a ton of people don't agree with them that this is actually ideals that should be striven for, and they go plan. Why is that? Well, here's the thing. Here's a piece of problem, really. What is um, what is a metaphysical thing? There's no like the materialism and metaphysic type of the conflict is that in the conflict materialism we can touch things, we can touch things, hear them, smell them, you know everything. We, we we can we can study these things and all that, but can we study these ideals? Can we study these metaphysical things? Can we study these platonic type of things? No, we can't. We, these ideal things, not really. We can't really study. We can rationalize and debate all day, all night about what ideals are good, what ideals are bad. But there, there's, you can't just like nail it down like you, you can materialistic matters. I can nail down that the sky is blue, or that light goes at travels at this speed, or. The, 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 or that this, the, even that this, the, um, the earth is this circumference or whatever. These materialistic, or that the GDP is this 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 level or whatever. Or, you know, this, this improves the production of crops. We can nail down all these questions with materialism, but we can't really nail down any of the que- metaphysical questions. They're kind of out of our reach, you know, we don't, we don't really live in the metaphysical realm. Even though we have a certain connection to the metaphysical realm, or we envision it, or we... we or we, you know, maybe we invented whatever it is. We we have this whatever the um, nature of the connection is. We have this connection to that realm, but we don't live in that realm. So you end up with that problem, right? In the end, materialism. If you're trying, if you're gonna try to have your your idealistic um, thing fight against materialism, it's not gonna work. It's gonna it's gonna get defeated. 
eventually it's gonna fall from the on, on the down slot. You know? Especially in this era where a materialistic type of thing has grown to such strength. It just it just can't resist the thing. You're gonna have to have a materialistic core and then you can build this idealistic stuff around it, but you know, to, to make the metaphysics the core. Which is they kind of trying to do? They're trying to make the metaphysics the core. I'm trying to make it, try to set a capitalism, try to make it more the metaphysics more important than the materialistic to, to like you know make the metaphysics metaphysics serve the um make the uh, materialistic serve the ideal rather you know in that way it's not going to work in the battle materialism is going to win. Third positionists oppose capitalism and communism because they are materialist doctrines. Did yeah, this is the horseshoe theory, isn't it? Of the third position. The t third position's horseshoe. Well, they're both materialistic, so they're just... A yeah, we're gonna oppose them all because they're, all, they're materialistic. We are we are metaphysical smart 200 IQ geniuses who just know... We, 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 we transcended the material, boy. We, got, we know way better than that, sir. You know? They treat man as a malleable entity abstracted from the world around him. No. <laughs> Marxism, uh, this is the horseshoe problem. The communism does that. Yeah, it does. Capitalism? No, <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. Capitalism doesn't just. Capitalism does not go. Doesn't say. Here's the thing. Capitalism doesn't necessarily even say anything, and it doesn't necessarily dictate that. Well, you have to treat people like you know they're just abstract. They're just completely abstract and separate for the context. Blah 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 blah. <laughs> no. Um, if taking into account the context of people. Is better for you know dealing with people whatever the hell it is. On a capitalism, people will. There's uh, there's no dictation that it has to be so or whatever. That's the thing with these with people with a socialist mindset always have this, this sort of idea that well, this, the capitalism is dictating things. No, it's not. Capitalism is not dictating. There's very few things that capitalism really dictates, and these are the things that it, it, it you know has to keep itself in order. You know, it dictates stuff like, can you not steal? Thank you. Like, that. That type of dictation it is. A lot of, like, dictation of, you don't do. Don't do, right? But it's, you know, all you have to do, you just abstract people from their context and blah, 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 and the surroundings and blah, 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 blah. No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <clears throat> and malleable, um, humans are partially malleable. But let's say that, comp let's say, let okay, give an example. Let's say a company um, knows that certain. Let's say like let's say like that um. Let's say like let's say that capitalism, you know, you have a capitalist system, and in the and you have the com the company the uh, I say that the company, and the company finds out that hey, because let's say we we have all these irrational beliefs being thrown out, so then. You know, all these isms have been disregarded, finally, because Marxism has been defeated, totally. And we find out that, well, certain people have certain genetic predispositions over certain things. And we find out a way on the capitalism, because obviously people are going to try to figure out, okay, how do we figure out how, what people have certain predispositions? And then, they're going to look at who is more predisposed over certain things, and they're going to say, okay, um... Because we have to, it's not, in going after efficiency, it doesn't, it's not, we're not gonna try to mold everyone. No, we're gonna see who is most moldable to a certain task, because that's gonna be the most efficient molding process. You know, how less molding you have to do, how more efficient it is. And then they can quote unquote be molded better to, to something, whatever. And by the way, that's another thing. They're not gonna be, it's not that they're being molded by some sort of like central entity or big entity just like, like molding them, like or the system is molding them. No, it's they are probably gonna decide to do training or change the way to act, whatever, and then in many ways mold themselves in with the assistance of, let's say, um, probably with a sense of something, uh, maybe the system, if you call it, will probably assist them in molding them into whatever they want to mold themselves into to you know become. Um, uh, to and really achieve their goals, that's really what it is. But um, again, there's, there's no dictate. It's not this thing about though we're getting dict we're dictating towards. No, nobody's saying dictated towards that they should mold themselves to disagree or not, or the, or that they game or they will get molded to disagree to this uh, thing. It's no dictation. There is no dictation. There's incentives, perhaps. And maybe they consider incentives to be coercion dictation, perhaps. 
Third positionists opposed the abstraction of man and emphasized the importance of things like... No, but these people... Uh, it's ironic because it, it did a weird metaphysical... In a weird like metaphysical thing, um, you're kind of abstracting man. Like the materialism, the materialism, you end up with the least abstracted image of man. It's when you enter this metaphysical realm that you really enter an abstract vision of man. Like race, culture, and religious belief, in not just shaping man, but giving importance to his life. Third positionists opposed the tendency. Yes, of course, these things may very well have certain effects and you reserve us shape humanity in this way or not this or the other way. Okay. Capitalism doesn't necessarily oppose this. It's not capitalism that's opposing um the um recognize these that these things shape people. It doesn't. See of capitalism to destroy these traditional sources of meaning, leaving nothing to Yeah, so the idea is that capitalism is the one destroying everything. Well, to a Hoppian, it's the state which is destroying these things. Replace it with soulless individualism and hedonism. Third position. To, in the natural order view of things, hedonism leads to self-destruction. The only way to keep hedonism in ch um, keep going is by having some entity or another keep the hedonists and the, you know, these decadent people in, in keep them afloat. And the only entity that really does that is a state. In a sort of free system, uh, you know, in a free, they sort of free, uh, you know, if you feed them. No, people are going to be, yes, people are going to be very hesitant about supporting, let's say, head, um, head, hedonists or decadent people. They're going to be very hesitant because they're like, no, you're not, not going to support your, your stinking lifestyle. Are you crazy? So, yeah, um, and again, that type of behavior is self destructive anyway. So, if there's no support, all you have to do is remove the support and it's over. Traditionists believe in the importance of hierarchy. Those that work hard. Well, in capitalism, hierarchy is naturally formed, and capitalism doesn't destroy hierarchies or whatever. It should be rewarded. Well, it might replace certain types of hierarchies with others. Um, supposedly more rational hierarchies. The most fit to rule should rule, and society should strive to produce great writers, artists, and innovators. Because third positionists believe in true hierarchy, they are totally opposed. True hierarchy. True hierarchy just means the hierarchy that they see fit, which often will put themselves on the top of the hierarchy, right? Goes to the Marxist tendency to oppose all hierarchies as unjust, but also the false hierarchy of capitalism, in which the only hierarchy that rules is that of money. This is a lie, of course. I mean, the idea that it, it's just... In capitalism, capitalism dictates that hierarchy is just set up out of your money. What? No, you idiot. No, you... Look. Even in their position as whatever system, the wealthier are still going to have a higher position than, let's say, the pleb. It's like even in your little third world thing, money is going to have an, um, an effect. The, the, the main point, though, is that money is going to be a factor regardless of whatever system you have. You know, the ones with more, more money, it's probably going to be a little bit higher on the, you know, on the, on the totem pole. Just, you know, that's, that's in all systems. So... Is it a main factor? Is it even a main factor in capitalism? No, it's not. It's not a main category in capitalism. Unless you made it, make it to be, of course. But it's not inherently the case. Uh, you know, we, we can have... You, you, can, you can set... Or it can be... Uh, what, uh, any uh, factor can be set as a main core factor under freedom. It doesn't have to be money. Some, in some situations, it might be money. Sometimes the main hierarchy might become money. Maybe, or maybe it becomes status. Status. Or maybe it becomes social proof. Or maybe it becomes, you know, maybe artist starts r rising in the social, you know, status. It may, uh, I mean, if you don't look at it, uh, look at a world today, is, it's really, if you look at how the world is set up, is it really the wealthiest who, you could say, are really at the top of the hierarchy? When in regards to like, people, they see the people see the, the hierarchy in society of you know, in society, it really matters of who is more important, who is more important, who has more influence, more power. This is really what the hierarchy is of. It's composed of wrongs of power and influence that suddenly go up and up. Because power and influence allows you to, in a way, 
send orders to people, even directly and indirectly, send orders to people below you, and that way change things. Now the thing is that even uh, you know you have you have you can have you know that he shows a picture of let's say Mr. Soros, but you know um, Soros may have a lot, quite a bit of power, quite a bit of influence, but even he isn't really the top. Even he isn't really really at the top. Not really really at the. He might have a lot of money, but that's it. Money, yeah. So what? So so what? That's not. Money is not all, the whole game. Money is not all. You can't purchase the will of others with money. You can influence them, perhaps. You can budge them a little bit. Or you can throw money around. But it doesn't provide you this overriding power. No, it takes a lot more than money to do this. A lot more than money. You know? So, uh, and again, this is, again, it's, it's a matter of really, of, is this even... You know, the importance of money under a free system. Is it really inherently or necessarily greater than the importance of money in other systems, I suppose? No. In the end, not really. We talk about power and influence. Money's going to have a similar kind of influence all over the place. It's just going to have this... It's just going to have sim the similar thing. I suppose the question becomes, it's, where, it's not a matter of really, I, I guess here's the thing, it's not really a matter of money itself, but the question is, who has that money? That's the a, that's a main point. The factor of money is always going to be kind of important in no matter what system. The question is, who has the money? And that's probably going to be the main contention, you know, where these different entities are going to be like, no, I should have the money. For the third position, I guess the state should have most of the money. Right, and hopefully, and aka the ones who control the state and control tons of money in the society instead of what they perceive to be these unloyal or you know, disloyal, you know, capitalists, you know, this soroy, this freaking mysterious soroy who are using the money for unseemly things. The state is going to, heavenly state is going to have the money to do all these things, you know, to have all this influence and power and all this. To, because they probably do see that in in their view, capitalism allows you to best buy up everything or everyone, with no limitation. And in the third position, everything is already bought out by the state, so you can't buy it out. So then, taking control of the state becomes perhaps even more important than money. I guess that's a, uh, I guess that's that should be the the proper formulation. That's a, that's a pop formulation indeed. Taking over the state becomes the main source of power and rising up in the hierarchy. While money itself, the factor of money itself, gets overwritten to a certain degree. Even though if you take over the state, you're still going to get a ton of money. But, um, you know, it's still going to a certain degree overwritten. Although, come to think of it, Money is, uh, is it really money? Like, where does the money come from, I guess the question. It comes from the control of other things. And money can give you control of, of other things as well. So, you know. And you can lose money if you do the wrong decision. So, that's what you end up with. It's a, it's a very, very delicate, very, very, it's a very, very delicate um, thing that we have here. Yeah, it's almost like we we're giving this option. You know, they're giving this the, the economy where they're like, well, either either the soroy get all this money, and money becomes the most important thing in society, in the capitalism, and that way you end up with you know the entire society just getting taken over by soroids who have all the money, or you, you have a state you know take over and uh, have control of the money and among other things. And have us be head of the state and make sure everything goes okay and keep the soroys, make sure that those soroys can't take over. That's the thing, yeah. yeah. That is the key. I think that this is a very muddy point, though. It's a very muddy point, you know. Not simplistic, they put it in a very simplistic terms, but 
this is a bit too simplistic to be honest. It needs, to, it needs a bit more consideration. And higher culture is destroyed by commodification and dominance. Yeah, what is what is higher culture? You know, um, Destinian Stry- Strike Arena had a uh, debate on this. And it's amazing how Destinian just crushed them on the higher culture question. Just utterly annihilated them. I don't know if uh, Keith, Keithy would have a better uh, a better chance. <laughs> but have like, yeah, like a better, like, would do better against Destinian this battle of high culture, but after, when I saw that, I was like, holy moly. Like, we can have a conception of what high culture is, but that's uh, going to be a personal opinion, to be honest. Like, well, we might come together and say, oh, this is, this is, this is, this is, ew. Right? This, this is la. Okay, yeah, sure. I guess. Of popular culture. Yeah, the popular culture, ooh. Popular culture just means the culture that people like the most. That most people buy. Oh, they will. The Trumpers will argue that well, but it's it's actually a matter of who they advertise. So they're just advertising it more. Why are they advertising it more? Because these freaking sorrows, man. These sorrows want to bring you down. So they advertise this crappy culture to you. I think it's always a matter of subversion, right? They're afraid of subversion. You're just getting, your high culture is getting subverted by these sorrows. Who have all the money? We have to deal with that somehow, so let's do a third positionist, shall we? Above all, the third positionist desires not just a political revolution, but a revolution of the self. Feeling disgust at the degenerate state people live in under liberal capitalism, third positionists seek to. Yeah, again, they say they, they think that freedom breeds decadence in itself, and not. Um, it, it sets out like freedom of coercion. From a state breeds decadence instead of coercion itself. The creation of a higher type of man in society. The new man is one of refined character, will, strength, and wisdom, but also a man of absolute self abnegation, respect, responsibility, duty, and service to the national community. Yeah, the, the, the music is beautiful. But, so here you have this idea. It's very, sounds very similar. It sounds. Eerily familiar, similar to the Soviet, um, you could say the Soviet new man. You know, if you if it's the Soviet new man, very very so this idea super idealistic. Even though this, this cartoons are supposed to be like you know this materialistic thing, they 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 did have this super idealistic um, Soviet new man. They, they did have some this idealistic component to them, especially the, I think Stalin, where. You know, he this guy is like perfect, pretty much perfect. Um, pretty much the the ideal man is envisioned by the state, by the powers, right? And in the end, this is a man which is envisioned. This high ideal of man is is how it is envisioned by let's say Keith Woods. And it sounds all fine and dandy and good, but. You know, in the end, it's going to be just a matter, it's just going to be a whole bunch of platitudes if we don't get to go into the nitty gritty of what it all entails. Because these are all the words which have positive vibes to them, right? Right? All these positive words, all these positive good things. But how we build that into people and how we, like, how we really build that into people and prevent corruption. And, you know, if it can really be done by the state. That is another issue. I mean, let's look at fa- let's look at Italy. I had a bunch of incompetent moron generals who didn't know what the hell they were doing. Incompetent moron e- army. They got st- stumped by Greece. <laughs> they barely took over Albania. This is probably what this is one result of your. This is what your ideal can end up to to or toward, right? There's this one way that your little thing can end up. So. You know, that's not, just because you have the idea doesn't mean it's going to actually go there. It might go the other way. For- and as we know, by the way, the state often, uh, the state does X and it, uh, for the goal of whatever, and then it does the opposite. It backfires massively. That happens so many freaking times. Today. That's not a problem. You know, I won't harm many. All these goals that they want, but, but a lot, they apply the state policy and it backfires. You know what happens? This is the problem. If you shoot for the highest ideals, but then it, you do something, you do use the state to, to get there and it backfires, you know what you get up with? 
the opposite of all the highest ideals. Okay, the worst, e the worst evils. <laughs> I guess that's the problem, right? That's a, that's a scary um, thing. Fundamentally, the desire of the third positionist is harmony. Her yes, harmony, harmony, harmony. We're gonna force harmony because we see that we have, we have to impose harmony on people because harmony between man and nature, between worker and owner, and between self-respecting peoples of all kinds living their truth. Anyway, so that was the video, and yeah, so they want to impose this harmony, the, the, this this harmony they see as the proper harmony or whatever, on everyone in the society, and make everything work according to my vision, Mr. Central Planner, and it's not going to backfire and lead to the opposite, the hell. Like it happened in Italy, and Argentina, and Spain, and all these countries which tried the little, the, the little things. And they fail, they unravel, they fail, and then you end up with the 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 the, the, the like Italy is being swamped by you know who, um, Spain is pff, pathetic, pathetic country. <laughs> Come on, look at look, look what Spanish are doing. Oh my God, yeah, Argentina. I mean, <laughs> hilarious. Argentina, you got the feminists taking over. And, and what is it like fifty years? It's just a matter of like 50 years and look what's happening. Every single one of these, these states have fallen to what I would call not even the Enlightenment. They've fallen to the corrupt Enlightenment of the West of today. They've all fallen to it. You know? Many times it's because they did not achieve harmony. They, they tried to impose their harmony and it backfired and it caused more trouble than ever was. And then it collapsed. The sort of internal stability was not achieved, and they actually got a lot of instability, which led to splatter. You know, so understand that while they they may they may have high sounding goals, they may have high sounding ob uh, a lot of objectives that they want to achieve. You know, when people use a state, usually you just end up with backfiring and utter opposite of happening. So, you know. You know, in a way, you know, I really, I, I, I wish that people would like think of may maybe, you know, so consider the backfiring. Maybe we should start to purposely make things worse. Use a state to make things worse on purpose, and maybe we'll actually get a good result. You know, at this point, it's like, why don't you try that? Why is that a good idea? This like failed so many times. This thing, oh, I'm gonna do the good ideas, and now, and um, we're gonna make it work. Just get a whole bunch of horrible ideas. <laughs> get the truth. Get make the truth trip position. Just get the worst ideas you can think of and implement them with a the state and hope that it backfires, which it probably will, and you get all the good things. That is probably what you should strive for. Anyways, that's all, and see ya.